I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Chris Melody Fields Figueredo, the Executive Director of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, or BISC. Chris joins me to discuss how the ballot initiative process, a process by which citizens can propose, create, amend, or repeal state laws, is core to a strong democracy. Ballot initiatives, also known as ballot measures, can be used to shape everything from abortion access to a state's minimum wage requirements. It's a really powerful tool that citizens can use to shape laws in their own states. And like many powerful democratic processes these days, the ballot initiative process is under attack. Chris talks about the ways in which the process is at risk and who's behind those attacks. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Chris Melody Fields Figueroa. Chris Melody Fields Figueroa, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. (laughs) You know, during election cycles, everyone who covers those cycles, especially the big ones, they kind of focus on, in relation to the ballot, they focus on the candidates, which kind of makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But I rarely hear a lot of coverage about the ballot initiatives, right? And, And in my state, in Washington state, there are always lots of initiatives on the ballot. But, you know, it's a really big part of our democracy. So if you could just give me and the listeners kind of a ballot initiative 101, a primer, you know, how do they get on the ballot? What are the requirements, et cetera? So about half the country has what we call the citizen-led initiative process. And if we take a further step back, um, one of the reasons why we have uh, ballot measures or direct democracy is because over 120 years ago, Um, our representatives in government were not listening to the people and not taking action on the issues that their communities were facing. You know, there was a lot of something that sounds very similar to us today, a lot of influence with corporations and and special interests. At that time, it was the railroad barons who had controlled the state legislatures. And so the initiative process was birthed out of giving the people the agency and power to take issues directly to their communities and in many ways pass policy that they were not seeing their representative and governments uh, take. So about half the country has the citizen-led process, which means they go into their community, they gather signatures for a petition to get an issue on the ballot, anywhere from raising the minimum wage or codifying the right to an abortion in their state constitution. Now, I I wish every single state had the same process. Um, Some are indirect to process in the sense that in the case of of Michigan, they gather signatures. It can go before the state legislature. The state legislature can act and choose to to pass the policy or they if they take no action, then it will go before voters. So it's a little different in, in, in many states, but what we generally know it is the citizen-led process, which we gather signatures in our communities and put something before the ballot. The other half of the country, so I grew up in Texas. We do not have the citizen-led uh, process in my home state. I didn't know anything about ballot measures until uh, I left my home state. I mean, I maybe there was a munis something on the, the local level um, growing up, but I honestly don't remember have state legislatures have what is called the legislatively referred constitutional amendment process where the the state legislature can refer something to the ballot that then voters uh, will, will take action on. So that's kind of the 101 process. I think what people are are most familiar in states like California, Oregon, um, Washington state, or like Colorado, really a lot of the Western states is this citizen-led process, which is what most people think about when we talk about direct democracy. So in those states where they have kind of a, a process where the legislature refers something to the ballot, that would depend on, you know, the, I guess the political makeup mm-hmm. of that legislature. So if you have like, you know, a completely red legislature, so the things that are going to end up on Absolutely. the ballot as a ballot initiative are going to be conservative. Yep. Do I have that right? Absolutely. And that's really a lot of what we're seeing even more and more uh, these days where we actually in 2022 saw less um, citizen-led measures and 
overwhelmingly the majority of the ballot measures that were before voters in 2022 were referred um, more, mostly from conservative Republican-led state legislature. So many of those abortion bans that were on the ballot in 2022 were referred by state uh, legislatures. So, um, you know, what we often were, you know, are trying to advocate for at the ballot initiative strategy center and, and what we think is really important for direct democracy is to give citizens the power, right? We know what our community's needs are. Uh, we have these conversations with our, our communities. We can see if there's a housing crisis in our community, you know, that is, you know, was the, the original intent of the, the process was it to be citizen uh, driven um, and what we are unfortunately seeing more and more um, is the state legislatures primarily in in conservative states um, refer things to the ballot and one of the reasons why that is happening is over the last several years citizens have turned to the initiative process to make change period raise the minimum wage increase education uh, funding for public education. To, cha- uh, to create a fair redistricting process. And after we started winning on those issues, state legislatures did not like that. They did not want to listen to the will of the people. And now what we have been facing over the last several years is an attack on the ability for the people to take issues to the ballot. Right, right. And I think, you know, Mississippi, I think their Supreme Court, I don't know if this was recent, but they completely did away with their ballot initiative process. And I know that there, you know, over the past few years, mm-hmm. there have been several attacks. Can you talk about those? Yeah, I'm, yes. In 2021, uh, the Mississippi State Supreme Court uh, struck down the initiative process um, because the state legis essentially the language that it, it what, when it was created, the process rec- was created in Mississippi was now out of sync of how many congressional districts the 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 state had because of redistricting in, in the census. So they had lost uh, a congressional district and the way the language was written into their constitution was you have to gather signatures from all of the five, I think at the time, congressional um, seats. All of those congressional seats don't exist. That's one way and the courts are playing an increased role um, in in the changes to the ballot measure process, but really where we're seeing it is in state legislatures the, themselves, state legislators, you know, doing anything from raising the threshold to, to pass a ballot measure. So I think most people understand, right, when you go and vote, if you, whoever has 50 plus 1% of the vote in, in most cases, right, that's the winner. Yeah. Now they're trying to raise the, 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 the threshold to 60%, to 67%. Uh-huh. I mean, it is so calculated in some states. It, for example, in Florida, after Amendment 4 passed in 2018, which was a, a ballot measure that restored uh, voting rights to formerly incarcerated or returning citizens, after that measure passed overwhelmingly, 64% of the, the vote, um, the state legislature then introduced and then referred to the ballot about measures that would increase the threshold to 65 percent. So these are being really calculated and, and very direct things like raising how many signatures you can gather and how, what does that and who can gather signatures in a state. You know, right now before Missouri, um, you have to be a resident um, of this uh, of the state for college students. Right. You may be going to college. You are, you are in that state, and it, you may not be able to participate in this really important democratic process if the state legislature um, passes this. And ultimately, this, these are efforts to undermine the will of the p- people. You know, some politicians are not happy that citizens are taking power into their own hands and really trying to make change. You know, Missouri has raised the minimum wage. They have legalized mar- recreational marijuana. They have tried to change the redistricting process. They're hoping uh, to, you know, address issues like housing or, uh, you know, uh, uh, improving the, the voting process in the state. Some politicians are not happy with that. And so they're trying to change the rules to benefit themselves and not the people. 
I'm presuming that most of these attacks are Republican led. I mean, just from what I've read. <laughs> I mean, they have been, uh, they have been <laughs> in GOP often uh, trifecta states. Uh, you know, Arizona is also one of those states that has been leading the charge, you know, again, as citizens have, you know, they raised, well, in 2016, they raised the minimum wage and, and did some relief on paid, paid sick. They, and then in 2018, they increased revenue for public education. And because of that, we've seen the state legislature, you know, almost entirely try to wipe out the initiative process in the state. And these have all been started um, or the attempts have been in GOP controlled states. So you have ballot initiatives and then you have, you know, the ballot initiative process, which I think is really meta is that sometimes the ballot initiatives initiatives attack. Yes, there are ballot measures <laughs> right. about ballot measures. Very, very meta. <laughs> so so how many so going back to the actual ballot initiatives, right? Ballot measures, how many are you tracking mm-hmm. um for 2023 and 2024? Can you quantify that? Yeah, so w- still there's a little bit We don't know quite yet what 2024 um, will look like, but right now we are currently tracking 112 statewide measures for 2023. A couple have already uh, qualified to the ballot so far. So for in Oklahoma, for example, there's state question 820, which would legalize marijuana for adults that are 21 years and older. They actually tried to get it to the ballot in 2022. The court, there's a whole court case. It, did, it didn't happen. It was too late. Uh, and so now it's, it's going to be before uh, voters in 2023. We were able to defeat abortion bans or constitutionally guarantee the right to an abortion in several states in 2022. You know, some state legislatures are looking to refer measures that would further uh, either, you know, all right, all right ban or further restrict abortions in states. You know, we're also looking at uh, bowel measures, um, which has been actually a, a really key issue area over the last several years around democracy. Things like the power of governors to act in an emergency, um, things like voter ID. Um, again, many of these, what we will look at, we'll see uh, in 2023 will be more defensive measures, often things that will try to take rights away from folks um, or create more onerous process. You know, we're looking at potentially, you know, depending what happens in these state legislatures, some more ballot measures about ballot <laughs> measures that would restrict the process. So you'll see more municipal measures um, in an odd year. We see often less statewide measures in, in an odd year. Only actually a handful of states like in Ohio and Maine allow um, for statewide measures in, a, in, in an odd numbered year. Um, so most of what we will see in 2023 are things that state legislatures are referring to the ballot. Yeah. And for, for the listeners, if you go to ballot.org, um, on one of the links, you can see a breakdown of the ballot initiatives by category. And the top category, I think you've already said this, is is democracy, right? Like democracy, the most, most of the yep. measures are in relation to democracy. And I'm assuming those are her attacks on democracy, not, you know, mm-hmm. shoring up democracy. I could be wrong. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, the attacks on what we've been seeing across the states. I mean, I come from, I have a democracy background. I've worked in, worked in democracy and civil rights for the majority of, of my career. So what we've been seeing at the state level, right, from uh, restrictions to voting, it, what is happening on the initiative process is, is very much connected that, to that, right? What is happening across America is a power grab. The country is shifting. It's changing. We're in the middle of great generational change. We're in the middle of uh, us as citizens really thinking about what our relationship with government and democracy looks like. And so what we've been seeing over the last several years on the attacks on voting rights, the right to protest, that is deeply and directly connected to what is happening to the initiative process where, you know, we are seeing these power grabs across the country and we're seeing a huge undermining of the will of the people. Democracy is ours. And unfortunately, there are those in government and our representatives in government 
who don't actually want a democracy of form by the people that are actually very out of step and out of sync with what the people want. And so that's really what's at stake this year, next year, um, uh, over the next, you know, what this battle that we've sort of been in over the, the last couple of years is what is the future of American democracy and is it going to be of form by the people? Yeah. And that's why I'm so glad we're having this conversation because, you know, it's it's gone way back, you know, past the last several years, if you think about it in terms of democracy broadly and voting rights, right? There have there has been a multi-pronged attack on democracy mm-hmm. for, you know, <laughs> the last well, forever. But specifically over the last couple of decades, you know, if you think about the gutting mm-hmm. of the Voting Rights Act, the Shelby B. Holder case, yep. you know, and this reminds mm-hmm. me so much of that in the ways that they're kind of attacking at, you know, conservatives and Republicans and people who don't like democracy, <laughs> you know, they're, they're just mm-hmm. attacking it from yep. every angle. Absolutely. I mean, this is my life's work. I fun, 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 like side story yeah. real quick. So I used to work at a, a civil rights organization. I was working on uh, the Shelby B. Holder case at, at that job and, 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 and the future of the Voting Rights Act. I was called for jury duty the day that oh, decision no. came down <laughs> and I'm like in between like the holding area for jurors and like going back into a conference call and I like remember going to the judge I was like I cannot be on the I believe in my civic duty but I cannot do this because oh and, wow because there was this really important supreme court case and he's like Yes, I understand. But <laughs> your colleagues can do the work. Oh, no. <laughs> he was like, I'm not having any of this right now. Um, wow. But yeah, I, it is. It's very much like this is what's happening in America. Wait, so he didn't let you um, out of jury been, duty for that? <laughs> no, I didn't get, a, 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 essentially, I, I did not get selected, but he was like, mm, that doesn't sound like an excuse to <laughs> a me. Little, little, d- no, but anyway, <laughs> it's, it's a very important thing. Yes. I mean, honestly, yeah. you know, we could have a whole conversation about Shelby Beholder, which I talk about ad nauseum. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You know, going back to this conversation, I'm really glad we're having it because um, this is one that's underreported, the ballot initiatives. And I actually, before I talked to you, I did not know that there were risks to it to this extent, mm-hmm. right? You know, like I said, I live in a, a blue state, yeah. Washington state, pretty safe. We have ballot measures, you know, on every single ballot, mm-hmm. ballot initiatives. And I just kind of took that for granted. So I, I hope, you know, yeah. listeners are just like, you know, realizing this is just one other area that we need to hyper focus on and make sure that we save, right? Absolutely. It's going to be up to us. You know, what is happening across the country in states like Arizona, Missouri, you know, Florida, Colorado, Colorado's being a little bit better, but, um, you know, states like Idaho, Oklahoma, right? Actually, some of those states are often forgotten, right? If you think about, if we're thinking about elections in, in terms of the presidential or Congress or the Senate, right? States like in Idaho, Nebraska, Oklahoma are not often, you know, reach the top of the conversation, but actually in states like that, the initiative process has been incredibly important, especially when they're, they have conservatives control their state legislature to make real important progress and, and change. So this is something that everybody should be aware of. It, if it's not happening in your state, if it's not happening today, it may happen tomorrow. And this is so deeply connected to everything that is going on um, and whether we as a country fall to fascism. I mean, that's exactly I, I, I yeah. got to be blunt. Like this is this is what is at stake in, in America right now uh, is are we actually going to have a democracy? Right. You know, and I think we should not shy away from using the correct terms, because if you look at what's happening as a mm-hmm. whole, you know, the attacks on voting rights, the book bans and all the other bans. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and now this. I, I, Yeah, it's it's very much at risk. <laughs> I mean, the book bans don't say gay. Exactly. I mean, literally, Florida right now is ground zero of what it will look like to have a police state stakes sanctioned violence like of what it, it would look like if we had fascism across the country. It's just, it is, it is literally ground zero right now. And there are amazing advocates on the ground that are fighting back that say, this is not Florida. This is not, the, I mean, my parents live in Florida. Like this is, this is their, these are their lives. And this is the lives of children and communities um, that are at stake. And 
we can't sleep on this. It, 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 you can't say even in a Washington state that this is go- isn't going to happen here. Something what is like what is happening in Florida can catch like wildflower. Oh, wildfire. <laughs> uh, maybe wildflower too. I, I don't know. Uh, well, I would prefer wildflowers, you know. <laughs> For sure. Right. But, but it, it is we, the people. It's us that is going to have to stand in the face of fascism to stop it. You know, I think I think everyone should just take a step back and try, you know, to think about how, mm-hmm. how you would describe what's happening here if you were seeing it happen in a different country. Absolutely. Right? And just try to look at it through that yep. lens. Right. Um, you know, I know that a lot mm-hmm. of people are worried mm-hmm. about being hyperbolic, um, but we really just have to be honest about what's happening here. Sure. I'm Venezuelan American. You know, I came to this country when I was, I was three years old. You know, my mother's Venezuelan. My dad's from the U.S., And what I am seeing happen in the United States is what happened to my home country. Um, And the reason my parents, you know, decided to live and raise me in the United States was because of opportunity Um, of, you know, and it was hard. I'm Latinx, you know, we we were working class. Um, Certainly our democracy was not designed for me um, and my family, but they believed in the promise and the hope. And they knew as a, you know, as a girl, you know, uh, someone who identifies as a woman, I would have more um, opportunity if I was raised in the United States. And my country, there is not opportunity. In Venezuela, there's not an opportunity for young people. My cousins have left yeah, um, because there aren't jobs. You know, that is what is possible in the United States if we just close our eyes and say, not here. Actually, it, it is happening here. And I don't want to scare folks um, because I, I do believe we can, we can stop it. I think we do have the agency to stop it, but we can't sit back and say, well, that'll never happen here. It's happening here. Yeah. You know, that's what what I think is so beautiful about your work on this specific project, you know, given what you just told me about your family's background. And there's nothing more core to democracy than citizens shaping the legislation and the country that they live mm-hmm. in. There's nothing, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's more central to the core of the country and democracy than, than mm-hmm. that. And that's why I think it's so beautiful that you're actually working on this specific project. No, I mean, that's what excites me, right? What excites me about ballot measures is possibility. And we believe very strongly at BIS that it needs to be a citizen grassroots led effort. The people who are most impacted by whatever change we seek. So if we're thinking about housing, right, we need to be talking to the communities that are, do not have homes or are at risk of high, uh, high rent or cannot find affordable housing, they are the ones that we need to be talking to before we even think about drafting any policy. We have to censor them. And these are often going to be low-income communities of color that are not often con- uh, included or given a seat at the table when we create any policy in the United States, right? Like that, we believe so strongly that it has to be not just a citizen-led effort, that it actually has to be led by the very people impacted by the change we, we seek. Florida Amendment 4 was led by returning citizens, formerly incarcerated folks. Who better to know the impact of losing the right to vote than someone who was incarcerated and lost that right. That's what we're trying. That's what we're trying to do here. And what does it mean when we center equity and justice? When we, from the idea to the campaign and all the way through, post, I and mean, we talk about the three hundred and sixty life cycle, like we have to think about every phase of the work and how we are censoring people, equity, and justice to ensure that we actually have policy and process that reflects people like that's what that 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 I think that is to me the excitement about the possibility of of ballot measures is it gives us agency unlike 
many of the other tools we have in our democracy. Yeah, that's such an, an excellent point. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're right. You said the promise of, of you know this country mm-hmm. and this vision. And we're all kind of working towards that promise. You know, we have. I don't think anyone mm-hmm. that I've talked to, especially activists and organizers, have ever said that this is a perfect place. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And we're mm-hmm. all kind of working towards mm-hmm. that promise. And this, like I said, you know, this ba- ballot initiative process is closest to the core of of democracy than anything I've heard of. And yeah. so I'm presuming, you know, given what right. you've said, that there's also um, a demographic you know, shake out to how ballot initiatives are filed, right? Do, do you have any data on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is one of the challenges that we're seeing with these restrictions that we're seeing to the ballot initiative process, right? You know, when you increase the signature thresholds, when you increase the threshold to pass, you're actually making it now a process with for people with moneyed interests. You know, it is harder for a grassroots organization from, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a small town in in, in Washington state. It, it makes it so much harder, you know, for community centered or grassroots organizations to actually be, be able to engage in a citizen led process if you are increasing restrictions. Um, or raising thresholds that that allow them to to in, engage. So, you know, we think it is so critically important that a process that was created to push back on special interest money, you know, if we if we make the it almost impossible, right, for everyday people to engage in ballot measures, then it actually isn't a, a people-centered effort anymore. It's, it, you know, it's going to be Uber and Lyft by, by the way, they have in California have tried, you know, put ballot measures on, on yeah. the process. Then it just, it doesn't, you know, that yeah. this is, this is what we're, we're we face is the corporatization of ballot measures. Yeah. Um, and that was not, it was, that's the <laughs> antithesis of, of why they were yeah. created. Yeah. So if you are a listener and a citizen and this conversation has really concerned you or maybe it's kind of inspired you, what would you what, what's your call to action to people? And as far as like saving the ballot initiative process, you know, getting ballots, you know, ballot initiatives in their uh-huh. state. Uh, I know you offer training and there's lots of information on ballot.org. What's your advice? I mean, I think 2022 was an example of we have to li- stop listening to polls and pundits. You know, there was a narrative written about 2022 way back at the beginning of the year that it was going to be a red wave, right? And so every decision that was made after that was based on that narrative. There's a different story of what happened in 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 2022 you know, we won every single abortion ballot measure. We raised the minimum wage in several states. We abolished slavery in several several states. So we won in so many incredibly important ways. And so that means it's on us if we if that's the world we want to live in, right? If this is is the change we seek, then it requires us to stand up and fight back, to go into our state legislatures, you know, you know, the, in the states where they're trying to, to roll back and not implement these measures that we pass as citizens, to try to take away the citizen-led process, you, you got to stand up, you got to, you got to, you got to speak out. You know, you have the ability to go to great grassroots organizations in your states, learn more about the work that they're trying to do and get in and become a part of their the, the way they are thinking about pay, building power in their state and, you know, potentially work with them to bring, a, you know, an, an issue before the ballot. Things like paid leave. Um, so it really requires us, you know, the call to action is to get involved, you know. Certainly, you can go to ballot.org, learn more about the work that we're, we do at, at the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center. But I guarantee there's a local organization where you are right now that is radically reimagining what is possible. And, and you can be a part of, 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 of those dreams and imaginations. So, you know, 
get up, get on Google, <laughs> you know, search or go into your community um, because there are so many phenomenal. Our role at BISC is to support leaders and organizations on the ground, right? And I can tell you, they're just badass, friggin' awesome um, groups in your local communities that are 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 already fighting mm-hmm. back. Um, so I, I encourage you to get involved. Yeah, that's excellent advice. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me. This has been really instructive. <laughs> You've enlightened me, uh, you know, about this process, you know, and, and I feel really kind of inspired and armed with information. I'm a little worried still, but I am <laughs> I'm more inspired. <laughs> sure. You know, you know, uh, you got it. You uh, were anxiety can be a motivating factor. That's too. true. That's true. <laughs> 